Kate. Welcome back to Kotlin Conversations, where we're having conversations with just a few of the amazing guests and speakers here at Kotlin Conf 2024. I'm Huintua Dow, and I'm speaking with... Anise Davis. Hi, Anise. I'm, I'm so excited. I cheated a little bit. Uh, and not, that's not cheating because Anise is amazing, but she's also a Thank friend you. of mine. So yeah, I'm taking the time to also c catch up with Anise, but also uh, talk to you and introduce you introduce you all to Anise and the amazing things she's doing. Uh, Anise, for the audience, what do you do and what's your Kotlin backstory? Yeah, so I like to joke, um, I do everything. Um, but these <laughs> days, I'm mostly focused on engineering leadership, somewhat of a fractional CTO, if you're familiar with that. And my Kotlin backstory is I'm an Android and Kotlin Google developer expert, and I've been a big fan of Kotlin from the beginning. So just really excited to be here and have another opportunity to speak at KotlinConf. So I, actually, I, I think it's really, your talk this time around is something that I think is really relevant because obviously KMP is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and not just that, but obviously not just in and of itself, but I think the adoption story for a lot of people has been yes. very interesting. Uh, I don't know about you, but like I know like a lot of times in my career, the whole multi, mul like the whole write once, run everywhere promise has been around for a long, long, long time. Yes. It really doesn't work out. Like I, I was very cynical for years because it never seems to work out, right? I, I've personally like had my heart broken by many, many multi-platform solutions, but it feels like this one might be sticking. Uh, yeah. And I, maybe I should be more enthusiastic. I, 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 <laughs> we're at Kotlin Comp, so I should be like, yeah, it's really sticking, like, but you- Is it sticking? Is That's it sticking? The That's actually a good question. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, just in general, like it's like a whole different way of doing things. I assume yes. I haven't had much experience, but you know, you and Nice, like that's what you're talking about is kind of like your journey at your right. work, right? On doing, on like adopting it. Yes, and I mean, so what I'll say is, um, I did some development using Flutter, and yeah. it was really cool. Like yeah. I got to learn Dart. I started dipping my toes into declarative programming, and I thought it was a decent enough solution. Being um, introduced to Kotlin multi-platform, it was just nicer. I, nicer. I think, you know, number one, it's Kotlin. It's yeah, great. Like, 100%. that was a language that I'm familiar with that I really enjoy programming in. Yeah. And for my team, also, a lot of people were familiar with Kotlin. And for, like, iOS folks, Swift is close enough where I feel like they understand um, what the Kotlin code is doing. Yeah. The thing that's really interesting to me about the KMP approach to cross-platform is the fact that you have the power over how much you want to share and you can continue to develop your native solutions for like your user interface, for example, mm -hmm. and you're not sacrificing anything. Right. You're getting that same power. And that is what differs from something like React Native or Flutter, mm -hmm. um, which was really appealing to me. And I'm the type of person that's always thinking, what's the worst case scenario? <laughs> <laughs> so if I try something, like what is the absolute worst case scenario? Right, yeah. And for KMP, the fact that it was already written in Kotlin and we had our you know, app developed into modules, mm -hmm. worst case scenario is we have to rewrite some Kotlin code in Swift. You know, like it, mm -hmm. it was worth taking a chance yeah. to explore that technology. So I think that's really interesting because I think like the common thing I hear a lot with KMP adoption is, and understandably like reticence from like iOS developers because yes. it is different. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there are like compromises you have to make in terms of each individual language to get that shared code. Yes. Like what, what was always your secret to getting iOS on board is basically what I want to ask. Like, how does that go? <laughs> I mean, what I'll say is that their concerns are valid. Okay. And 100%, yeah. I'm the type of person that's like, okay, let me put myself in their Birkenstocks, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so number one, it is not the same developer experience. Yeah. Just period. Yeah. It's almost like if someone told me you can no longer program in Kotlin, go back to C. I would be really no, thank frustrated. You. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm like, absolutely not. Yeah. Right. Um, they also feel likely a loss of autonomy. If I'm an iOS developer and I don't know Kotlin yet, I'm not familiar with KMP, now all of a sudden I have to wait for the Android people to do something mm -hmm. before I can make forward progress. Right. That's a valid concern. Yeah. Um, and then in general, what about my job? <laughs> I might have a sense of like, you know, this like decreased job security. And I feel like all three of those things are extremely valid 
concerns. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it's all true, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So for our iOS engineers, I just say like, look, work with me. (laughs) If, If at any point during this process, something feels like completely broken, you're blocked beyond, you know, whatever, you can't make any form of movement, mm-hmm. let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. And they were willing to take that chance. Yeah. And I think what really helped is just having that sort of openness, the continuous dialogue, and then allowing them to pair program with the Android engineers. Um, and eventually we got to a point where they could all contribute to the KMB code base. Mm-hmm. Um, one person was so excited. They took like a Kotlin programming course. Really? They okay. really wanted to like up their Kotlin skills, which yeah. was exciting. Yeah. Um, and in general, I feel like this is where we see the industry going. Yeah. There's no like iOS engineers, Android engineers. There's like maybe mobile engineers. And with Compose multi-platform, there's probably just going to be engineers. <laughs> right, right. And so for people's career longevity, I think it's time for them to start to embrace that sort of mindset. I, I really like that because I think that a lot of what you just said seems common sense, right? Just like pay attention. Maybe. I mean, it, it seems <laughs> like it. But the problem is it's, it's common sense. So I think that there it, it tends to get missed because you think, yeah. oh, well, of course, we'll talk to them and address concerns. Yes. But being explicit about it, keeping communication open and, and honestly having empathy right. um, kind of kind of resonates with like the keynote from the second day a little bit of like, you know, just being kind and, 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 yes. treating them. and as you said, like they're legitimate concerns. So rather yeah. than minimizing it, just dressing it straight on and giving them like an eject button, like, look, yes. it helps. Yes. Like, yes. no, <laughs> but I, I, that's really great. Cause I think that again is a challenge, but being explicit and intentional is yes. that's, it makes so much sense. I'm like, my mind is blown by how much sense that makes. But like, this isn't like the first time that you've like overseen a big shift. You know, I, I think we talked the last one of the times before we spoke at Cotton Comp, you were talking about GraphQL. Yes. yes. And and so that was a big shift also on, on at that time for you. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, with the, yeah a little bit I, about that. What I'll say is that adopting new technology, you have to have buy in from mm-hmm. executives. Um, yeah. And they have to see some sort of cost benefit. And I know that, like, as an engineer, I'm just excited <laughs> to find the new technology, right? I'm like, oh, we get to do this thing, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. I get to add this other thing to my resume. I get to... Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Um, trying to teach myself to think in terms of, okay, but what's the actual benefit to the business? Right. Um, I think sort of, like, pushes you to that next level in your, your engineering career. And for us, moving from REST to GraphQL, we just saw huge benefits, um, not only just from like being able to have this sort of like common schema, Mm -hmm. um, having developers being able to say, okay, there's this new design. It's going to require this one extra field. And that also happens to exist already. So Mm -hmm. boom, like there's no API work needed. Yeah, yeah. It also helped us save money um, because we were able to better take advantage of what GraphQL offers as far as their caching. Mm -hmm. So there's like multiple layers that they have and being able to cache um, locally using Apollo Kotlin um, for the native apps. Mm -hmm. And then also using um, the same thing, Apollo React um, on the website. And also being able to just share those queries and mutations with each other. I really felt like it helped bring all of engineering closer together, not just even um, the native developers. So, so that seems like to be a theme then, because I, would you, I mean, just, 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 just high level, would you, would you call like both those projects successful, at least as of now, like pretty good, like they were, they worked more or less? Yeah, that's a good question. What I'll say is for the goals of the business at that time, mm-hmm. they were successful. Great. Okay. And what's, you know, fascinating about business is that (laughs) the goals are always changing. Yeah. And I'll say that, like, depending on the talent that you have, how much money you want to spend on said talent, Mm -hmm. and then your future either investment or acquisition goals, Mm -hmm. you might choose a different solution. Yeah. Um, But I was very happy with the decisions that we made at that point. Yeah. And I'm certain, like certain, certain, that that led to the company being acquired for such a really reasonable uh, price, which people probably wouldn't have expected from like this 21 year old company. Yeah, I, 
And I, I kind of think that's super interesting in that. I, I, so kind of going back to another thing that you said was that, you know, you had to learn how to talk to stakeholders and people above you. And I think sometimes as engineers, we just want to stay in engineering world and yes. like kind of build our things. But I think what I noticed about like my, my favorite engineers and like people that like I looked up to as a senior is that they had a sense or they, they learned how to communicate. And it, at least, if anything, if not, you know, think it's not like they wanted to become like product people or managers, yes. but yeah. you know, they, they learned enough and they appreciate enough. And I guess you can even call it a sense of empathy to talk to business and understand what yeah. their needs were. And yeah, like, as you said, like the business concerns, like, I mean, I think sometimes I, I know even me, I just like leave me alone. I just want to do compose or whatever and like, just pay me <laughs> yeah. and I'm good. Right. But at the same time, like you're part of a, an organization, a business, yeah. And so you need to learn that that's like mm -hmm. a skill. And, and it's not like to say, again, you don't have to be a manager or product person, but you know, that, that it's part of your work. And I, I think I, I really mm -hmm. like that because that seems like another theme is that learning to communicate and come to where people are, whether that's an iOS engineer right. or, you know, your managers or your stakeholders, that seems like an important thing. And that seems like it was like part of your it's success. It's so important. Yeah. I remember, um, like once I graduated from college, I was more like, I don't need numbers anymore. <laughs> I wish, yeah. I'm done with the, <laughs> I'm done with the calculus. I'm done. Like, yeah. don't ask me any, you know, no, no, no more numbers. And starting to work more closely with finance and trying to build empathy for what they were trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll take like the most basic business accounting fundamentals at least. So when they tell me words like EBITDA, I'm like, oh, okay. What is that? Wait, what's that? <laughs> No, <laughs> EBITDA. That's that's how they're reporting the finances. Okay. So they might say like, "Oh, we need to have six million dollars in EBITDA this year," and so it's looking at expenses okay. and trying to you know versus income, etc. Okay. Yeah. And they're the way they do you know their math money stuff is yeah. so different from just like us day to day. Yeah. You know, with our own personal funds. Mm -hmm. And so being able to understand a little bit more about that also help me I feel to make smart technical decisions yeah honey. and to be cognizant of the money that we were spending mm -hmm. and where that money went and how they allocated it mm -hmm. I I know I remember you I used to say to myself like so we can't get new laptops right. you can't get new laptops <laughs> my build is too slow I need the M whatever please. but you can yeah. spend money on that right yeah right? Totally. and then that, you start that, yeah. realizing wait a minute they have buckets and this this money can only be in this bucket mm -hmm. in this bucket for the reporting reasons yeah um, and then you start to, you know, like I said, just develop even more empathy for the finance people, mm -hmm. which they were like the enemies for so long. And now we're like, actually, we're all in the same company. So, yeah. you know, we had to make this thing a success. Yeah. I mean, it's not just about like handholding and like being, mm -hmm. but also just getting to what you guys, what you all needed to do and, yes. and like kind of get the engineering there. Right. Like, so now that you've gone through so many like these big kind of shifts, shift yeah. in technologies, do, do you think like you have a sense or is there something that like, do you have like a, a, a spidey sense or something for yeah. a big move? Like when, like what, what is it that makes you confident about, or at least we're willing to take the risk for a big change? And what is it that kind of maybe sets your spidey sense off and like, like, like what kind of, kind of like good tips on, okay, this is a good idea. That's a bad idea that you've gotten from doing big changes. You know, I like to see what's happening in the world. And I know that sounds like really <laughs> generic to an extent, but I I think a lot about like, okay, where are we um, just like, we're such a connected world, even more so when I was younger now. Yeah. One thing happens here and there's just like this ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So I like to see what's happening in the world. Um, think about it this way. Over the past two years, over 300,000 people in tech have been laid off. Yeah. What does that tell you, right? So now, so I started thinking of things like that. Well, what is that telling me? Mm -hmm. If this many people have been laid off and I'm noticing large companies, mid-sized, small companies, look at the shifts that they're making. Look at the investor behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big stock person. Like I said, don't show me numbers, <laughs> um, but at least I can read what they're doing. Yeah. And I go, oh, it looks like there's a lot of contraction happening in yeah. the industry. Yeah. And I could see a future where, like I said, there's just developers. Right, right. And being more of a generalist is actually going to help you have a more successful career. Or understanding more things about finance is going to help you accelerate mm -hmm. your career, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I go, hmm, I think this one may be worth 
going deeper. Yeah, like seeing how it fits in the overall picture outside yes. of you. So I like that. So like empathy, communication. And, but, but I mean, really, it's about understanding things outside of yourself, yes. whether that's people or trends. So yes. yep. that's amazing. Yep. I love it. Uh, so I, w I could talk to Anise for like hours and hours and hours. I don't think we have hours, but uh, well, thank, thank you. you so much. You are Anise is actually very nice and like taking time out from her talk prep to be here. So please go and watch her talk uh, yes, uh, on, on, and you're, you're going into details on the, your kind of case. Yes, yes, I'll story. be talking all about it. So for all like the really nitty gritty, please check out Anissa's talk. Uh, Anissa, if people wanted to find you on the internet, how can yeah, they do that? Yeah, you can look for me on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, also known as X sometimes. Um, yeah. All right, well, <laughs> so Anissa, thank you so much. Good luck on your thank talk. You. I'm thank so you. glad to see you and spend some time with you and we'll see y'all the next one. Bye.